Chair Hart and members of the board, departmental item number one is from the County Executive Office. It is a hearing to consider recommendations regarding a coronavirus disease 2019 COVID-19 update. Thank you. And uh, CEO Miyasato, would you like to introduce this item? Supervisors, as you know, we've been providing um, um, updates on COVID-19. Today we have um, various folks providing the update, not just Dr. Von De Reynoso, but Brian Olmsted, who is obviously, as you know, with our Sheriff's Department and also a member of our Unified Command. So he'll give, be giving part of the presentation on the Lompoc Federal Penitentiary issues. Thank you, Ms. Miyasato, and welcome, Mr. Olmsted. Good morning, uh, Chair Hart and members of the board. Uh, so I'm gonna give an update, like stated, on the uh, Lompoc Federal Penitentiary with the outbreak uh, taking place related to COVID-19. Um, just a little bit of information about the facility. It has multiple facilities within the campus and with a total of over 2,700 inmates uh, that are housed at the, on the property. March 18th was the first positive uh, test result of an inmate uh, at the facility. And then about a week later on March 25th was the second uh, positive uh, uh, test result of an inmate. After that, every day, uh, we started getting additional positive tests. During that time, public health uh, has been in contact with their, uh, the prison staff disease control unit and have been working uh, with them. As the numbers grew, there was a fear that with the congregate setting that a prison has and the uh, um, amount of inmates that were tested positive and several being uh, taken to area hospitals and put on ventilators, there was a fear that if it continued, it could overwhelm the area hospitals, including if there was larger outbreaks in the, uh, in the community. And uh, we started working on uh, a solution. Uh, Saturday, April 11th was our first conference call where we included the uh, California Office of Emergency Services, the Bureau of Prisons, and Santa Barbara County Unified Command. Um, we, we talked about the issues and started looking for a solution. Over that Easter weekend, uh, um, that following Monday, we uh, developed a plan and a request that uh, the penitentiary build a uh, mobile hospital within their facilities. So, we could move some of the inmates that were in the local area hospitals below the level of the ventilator back onto the campus of the prison, plus also as new uh, inmates tested positive and needed medical attention, they could stay on campus, relieving the, any kind of pressure that would be on the hospitals. Um, the plan was developed and uh, it was decided to build a mobile hospital on the facility, um, the Bureau of Prisons is in the process of contracting with a national health carrier, um, Aspen Medical, to uh, staff that and develop uh, the plan for it. Um, they, uh, public health and members of the Unified Command met um, several times on the site with prison officials and uh, they decided on a old factory that's on the prison grounds as the, the best place to convert to a mobile hospital. The plan involves phase one and phase two. Phase one was to take part of the office area of the, uh, the prison area or of the factory and uh, convert 11 offices into isolation areas for the, uh, the mobile hospital. Um, phase one's, they've already started the construction on phase one and they're working on completing that in the next several days to uh, week. Phase two is to continue converting the rest of the factory into a congregate setting with at least 60 to 80 beds in that congregate setting. Um, phase one will include up to 22 patients uh, in those office cubicles. The, uh, as of right now, uh, the healthcare providers working on obtaining all the medical equipment and uh, establishing their staff and getting them transported here. Um, the prison is working with Army Corps of Engineers to uh, identify how they're going to do phase two build up. And, but like I said, phase one's already been approved and they're working towards getting that completed. The uh, current numbers as of yesterday afternoon is 96 inmates have tested positive, 12 are in area hospitals, and 29 staff members have tested positive 
and one is in an area hospital. Additionally, there's been one inmate death related to COVID-19. Um, like I said, uh, we're in daily conference calls during the Monday through Friday with the, the California State Office of Emergency Services and Bureau of Prisons with the Santa Barbara County Unified Command, and we're continuing to work through this issue to relieve any kind of pressure that the inmates might put on the area hospitals. Thank you, Mr. Olmsted. That's really helpful and very comprehensive report. Uh, questions for Mr. Olmsted? Any questions in Santa Maria? Supervisor Lavanino. I'm not sure it's a question for Mr. Olmsted, um, but it might be. So if we, if we add the um, total number of, of uh, prisoners or inmates, that's 96, and then 29 employees gives us 125 active cases, that's more than half of our total active cases for the entire county, isn't it? Because I showed, I think 236 is active right now. That might be for Dr. Reynoso. Yeah, if you look at the total, we're over 400 in total positive cases. Obviously, some have recovered, but uh, this list, uh, the numbers I'm giving are the positive numbers, not so much how many have recovered um, since then. Okay. Um, some have been transferred back to the facility because they've recovered from the hospital. It is a large percentage of the county's numbers, though. Thank you for that and then clarification. One last question is I, I did have one other question is, <clears throat> and I, I don't know if Brian has the answer to this, uh, but why have we only seen, we've only seen one, I think, one case at Santa Barbara County Jail, and I believe there's only been one case at CMC. Was there, was there a, um, I mean, is it something we're doing right, or was um, was there a protocol difference at a federal prison that, you know, have we gone back to find a source, or do you have any idea on that? So the, the prison has a disease control unit that they're identifying, uh, trying to trace that back to the, the initial uh, infection. Um, they have put the whole facility on lockdown. They've uh, really restricted the movement of the uh, inmates and the staff, um, they're doing uh, uh, checks, temperature checks for the employees as they come in. Um, with the sheriff's office early on, we, uh, we um, started a very strict uh, um, process of trying to control and prevent the uh, um, COVID-19 from coming into the facility. And uh, um, so far we've been very successful with it. Um, our, uh, our inmates are first, as soon as they're booked into the facility, they're in a quarantine location for at least two weeks where they're monitored. And then after that two weeks, they're uh, checked again and then they're moved into a different part of the facility. So we've had a very, uh, a very robust uh, system of trying to uh, keep COVID out of the, uh, the jail. Thank you, that's helpful. Any other questions for Mr. Olmsted? Okay, thank you. Thanks. Dr. Del Reynoso, welcome. Good morning. Um, I'd like to begin my update with uh, a glimpse at our latest numbers. So of the total cases we have as of yesterday, that is uh, 416. So as you can see, the Lompoc area with um, 96 of the cases being related to the prison and 72 cases in the community, this totally, this whole uh, bar represents 40% uh, of our cases. Next is in the Santa Maria area, we have 101 cases, so that represents about 24% of the total cases. Uh, following would be Santa Barbara with 11% and Orchid at 8% and South County at 5%. In, 
In terms of age distribution, we have the two largest groups are the 30 to 49 year olds at 35 percent, and that is this number, 147. And the 148 cases in the 50 to 69 year olds represent 36 percent. So we do have in the uh, 0 to 17 age group about 4 percent, followed by the 18 to 29. Um, at 16% with above seven, 70 and above at 9%. So it is um, distributed throughout all age groups. With regards to patient status, we have 45% recovered, 43% recovering at home, 11% still in the hospital, with 1% death. And of the uh, patients in the hospital, we have 65% of those hospitalizations non-ICU, with 35% in the ICU. So this graph um, gives a snapshot of the total cases um, in our county. So earlier, um, Supervisor Lavagnino asked about the prison total. So if, you, if we look at the uh, total of uh, prison uh, cases, that would be 125. But if we break that out, 77% are due to inmates and 23% are due to uh, employees. And those employees are distributed throughout our county. So the prison total makes up about 30% of all of our cases. Case by patient status. So the first three lines, so here we have, this is our grand total. You can see that we are still increasing incrementally with yesterday being at 416 cases. Of that, 57% are existing active cases, and 42%, the green line here, is recovered. The bottom line, the bottom graph, this purple dot, denotes the new cases in our county. With Supervisor Adam. Yeah, I need to make a point on those last two graphs that, that you know, that, that total is an accumulation of all of the known cases. Um, it, it isn't accurately reflective of the current conditions because it never takes off the 45% that we know recovered and it doesn't have any uh, recognition of any amount of cases that may be out there that uh, people were asymptomatic or even had mild symptoms and, and uh, just self-medicated uh, self and got over it by themselves and never got documented. So I, I, I'm not a big fan of those graphs. They that is true. These never increasing amount forever and ever, amen. So these graphs capture confirmed cases. We have, um, it's anecdotal, the level of um, asymptomatic cases out there or cases that are mild and are not reflected. Um, so these, again, are reflective of only uh, people who have tested and are confirmed. It's probably and, important and to add Dr. that. Reynoso, I wouldn't know and, how and to Dr. capture. Reynoso, uh, we only tested people, uh, I apologize for the delay, but we only tested people that were presenting with symptoms. Is that correct? Correct. And that has been Obviously. under the guidance of CDPH um, and our community health care professionals. Uh, well, with that, limited that testing, be, I. It leads you to 
conclusions that are, that are kind of wacky. That may be so, but we as a public health department are following the guidance of CDC, CDPH, as well as all the uh, healthcare experts in our community. And the reason for that guidance and the reason for less than ideal testing capacity is the shortage of tests, both Correct. here in our county and across the country and the world. And so the public health officials have, I think, wisely said we need to ration the tests to the folks who are most um, obviously in need of medical evaluation. But Supervisor Adams' point is that if we had more tests, we would have more uh, positive cases is true. Yes. Well, if, if Supervisor Adam could, could tell you that I, my point is that the, the information is, is at least semi, if not wholly invalid on those graphs and, and you know, the, we can't make any more tests appear. Nobody can. So the, the fact that we're not doing any random sampling in favor of just sampling people with, with that present with symptoms is, uh, is, is destroying the, the, the validity of the test, if you will, or, or the, the calculation, because uh, it, you, you just can't sample only people who are sick and then come up with a graph like this that shows an ever-increasing number. It's, it's just an invalid question. You're asking a, an invalid question, and that's all I want to say. Thank you, Supervisor Adam. Dr. Donoroso, go ahead. Oh, um, oh, excuse me, Supervisor Williams, sorry. Point. <clears throat> well, I, 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 uh, I think the department has uh, followed the guidelines correctly on, on testing. Uh, I think um, we do have data that indicates our testing per capita is comparable for other communities, so I don't think people should be operating under the assumption that if they lived in another county, they would be getting tested. Um, there are some communities, very small ones, that have been able to uh, test general population, but as far as the information I've gotten, uh, those are communities where somebody with a lot of money has rolled in and, and paid a ton of money um, in order to um, be able to do that. So a little town of Bolinas um, uh, is testing everybody, That's, but it, there are only 1,600 people, and the cost is 400 that thousand dollars for that. If you looked at the population of Santa Barbara County and did that, it would be, I believe, $120 million. Um, so if anybody has $120 million lying around, maybe we could change the, the, the situation dramatically, but um, we also uh, do believe that the public health is pursuing options that will be able to increase our, our testing. But I do want to agree with Supervisor Adam that this is not as useful of a graph as if you are illustrating the curve in which we are used to seeing it, which is either in the amount of people currently hospitalized or currently active cases, because this graph will continue to grow no matter whether we get it under control or not, right? Uh, because it's a cumulative amount of cases. The one thing it does illustrate is that the growth in cases is linear and not geometric, which is a good thing. Um, it means that uh, we've, we, we have never had the uh, geometric spike. Um, so that means journalists, you shouldn't use a, the term spike for anything in Santa Barbara County because the growth is all linear. Um, but um, it would be helpful if, if you could provide the, the data in the um, form we've been used to seeing it internationally, nationally, and locally, which is in the hypothetical graft curve, at, and we could now assess that versus the actual curve of Santa Barbara County. Right. I, I apologize for not including that. I have so many uh, graphs this morning, and so at the risk of um, uh, boring you to death over the graphs, I. Uh, last minute took that out, but uh, I can say that if you're looking at the bell curve uh, model that we had presented um, in April 2nd, we are actually well below what we were projecting, and I have a, a slide that briefly touches on that. Um, I am uh, 
I think that because of all the interest in the uh, different types of uh, graphs, I will make that, I will post those uh, graphs on our website uh, with some context so that the reader can understand how we're uh, tracking uh, cases and hospitalization um, as well. Thank you. And I think that's a great segue to your next slide. Which yes. Is so this graph is useful because uh, we have been asked, well, how do we know the percent increases in cases uh, day by day? So this graph is a nice de depiction of even though the cases are growing incrementally linearly, we see that it is on an out downward trend. It is variable, so it is not consistent. The only consistent thing I can say about this graph is that we're seeing a downward trend. Um, but there again, it, there is variability day to day. And so hopefully the goal is to see some consistency in the downward trend. So the takeaways, a uh, lower number of cases than predicted in the model. Uh, and, and we believe that it is directly tied to Governor Newsom's executive order and that our community efforts to adhere to physical distancing as well as the compliance with health officer orders to prevent the spread. Um, however, the number of cases still are increasing uh, with the active cases still growing. So there's that potential for spreading. Um, and we absolutely need to see consistent decline in cases over time to inform our policy changes. Question um, on that. This is Supervisor Lavinino, Lavinino. Go ahead. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just on that last bullet, need to see consistent decline in cases over time between the number of cases still increasing and active. So. Are we lumping in, I mean, that includes the lump of federal prison as well? I mean, if let's just say we had a complete drop off and we're seeing this, we're, we're kind of seeing this elsewhere is that we're seeing outside of Santa Maria and the lump of prison, a decline in new cases. Um, are we gonna do this even if we continue to have the problem at the prison but nowhere else? I think that is a great question and that is something that our team is looking at and the reason why we want to look at, at in, we want to include the numbers from Lump uh, Prison in our analysis is because it's such a fluid situation. You have staff who live in the community, and there is uh, it, and that affects our community um, interactions. It affects the number of cases. So I don't believe that you can totally remove what's happening in the Lompoc prison from the equation. I wouldn't say you have to eliminate it, but I would say you would have to balance it with what the health is of the rest of the right. county. I think is that, that is something that we would take into consideration, definitely. So um, if there aren't any questions, I'd like to move into sharing with you um, the preliminary demographic data of our cases. You know, Dr. Reynoso, just before you get to this next phase, I think the clerk has uh, an announcement that she'd like to make. Yes, thank you, Chair Hart and members of the board. Uh, my apologies for the interruption, but I did just want to let the members of the public and the media know that we are uh, allowing um, media into our April 21st, 2020 board hearing, that is today. Um, so if any members of the media would like to participate in our hearing room today, um, they can do so and just call the clerk of the board at 805-568-2240 to let us know that you are coming and we will escort you up to our hearing room. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Dr. Renoso, to Renoso. So this is, um, if you visit our website, you can click into any of the, these areas and it will uh, delineate the number of cases. So I just wanna, in case you have not explored this feature, on our website it is available. So we were able to uh, interview or at least touch base with 307 of our cases 
And so that depicts um, if we currently have 416 cases, this describes about 74 percent of our total cases. Uh, we did interview 221 cases. Um, and, and to this, I really want to give a shout out to um, the Public Defender's Office for assisting us, as well as uh, general staff in the Public Health Department for making this possible. We were able to go back and interview the, um, the cases within a 10-day period. So that was pretty, pretty um, astonishing. Uh, we are including 86 cases from the prison in our analysis, and it will be noted when we do that. So race and ethnicity of the uh, non-prison population. So these are the 221 cases in our community. And this consists of, um, we have 61% of our cases um, in the Hispanic group, 31% uh, among the white group, and 1% Asian, 0.5 in the American Indian, 2% in African American, 0.5% Native American Pacific Islander, 2% denote that they are multiracial, and about 2% refusing um, to answer. So when we compare that number, the number of cases that we interview with the uh, representation in uh, Santa Barbara County population, you have in the olive, the olive column is the comparison. So the His Hispanic cases are overrepresented, underrepresented among whites, underrepresented among the Asians, a little bit. So I want to say that the American Indian, Alaskan, Native, the African American, Black, um, as well as the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, these are really, really tiny numbers. So that would be very st statistically challenging to form any conclusion. Okay. So if we include the incarcerated population in our analysis, the numbers change. However, the overall representation still is um, on track with overrepresentation among Hispanics. We note here that even though statistically it's, it's, it's challenging, you see the numbers um, for the African American uh, black population is doubled. The primary language is English with 19%, Spanish. Health insurance, about 90% of our interviewees have some form of insurance, whether it be private insurance or public insurance, with 8% um, without any form of insurance. When we ask whether they have health care provider they can see, 84% of the respondents say that yes, they have a health care provider that they can see, with 15% saying no. Household sizes. We have 31% of our respondents living in household two or less, and 53% living in household with three to five people, and 14% living in households with six or more people. The annual household income. We have rough, the rough median is at 19%, and that's 50 to 75,000, with 24% on this side below the 50,000, and 26% on the other side above the 75,000. Education level. 
we have at the highest group with 30 percent sharing that they have some college or technical. So that's one to two years, three years of college or technical training. Knowledge of the coronavirus before getting sick. We have 80%, so that's 26, 29, and 25. We have, so this represents 80% of the interviewees saying that they have somewhat, they are somewhat knowledgeable to extremely knowledgeable about coronavirus. And where our interviewees heard about coronavirus is from TV news at 80%. Knowledge of hand washing before getting sick. So we have 80, we have 93% understanding that regular wash, about regular washing and able to practice it. So this is a really good encouraging number. Knowledge of social distancing before getting sick. We have 48% stating that they understand social distancing, meaning to keep six feet apart from others and was able to practice it. But what is concerning is the 16% in group A, 8% in group B, and the 24% in group C. So that all together amounts to 48% uh, who either are not understanding what social or physical distancing is, or understanding why it's important, or unable to practice it. So there's room for improvement in this um, group right here. Social distancing at home. 58% said that yes, they are able to practice it, with 38% saying no, physical distancing is not possible. So this is uh, social distancing at work. 39% says that yes, it, it's doable, with 36% almost as much saying no. So what are the takeaways from uh, our prelimi preliminary uh, demographics? As testing expands and our data collection progresses, the distribution by race and ethnicity for the cases may change. And our data currently shows that Latino Hispanic represent a disproportionately higher number of cases compared to their representation in the Santa Barbara population. We need to continue efforts to reach community members whose primary language is Spanish. We need to conduct outreach and enrollment efforts to the uninsured cases to make sure that they um, get plugged into uh, publicly insur insurance. We need to continue messaging, physical distancing, and hand washing. And we need to continue to partner with businesses and work sites to ensure optimal physical distancing. Actions that must be aligned in order to achieve. We need to make sure that the ability to care for the sick by the hospitals, and we are, are making strides in that. The hospital system are working to build up their surge. The public health department is actively working to distribute scarce medical supplies, prevent infection in those with a high risk of disease. We still continue to prioritize testing among the vulnerable groups, and we have plans in place to support those vulnerable groups who are unable to self-isolate, build capacity to protect the health and well-being of the public. We will continue to refine our health officer orders, and we will continue to focus um, targeted public messaging about 
physical distancing, about preventive measures that every member of our community can take, reduce social and emotional and economic disruptions. We have um, our community wellness in place, uh, and we continue to public message about how to stay healthy during this time, as well as the economic um, assistance available. So I'd like to end with just a quick um, recap or reminder about the governor's roadmap and where we're at. Uh, the first one, the ability to monitor and protect our communities through testing, contact tracing, isolating, and supporting those who are positive or exposed. So um, there's a lot of conversations about will we see cases increase as we expand testing? Can we test asymptomatics? Where are we with testing as a community? And um, I appreciate Supervisor Williams um, referencing that uh, per capita, Santa Barbara County is, is, is on target. However, we know that um, testing is, is a big concern. So the public health department is actively negotiating an increase in our capacity to test. And I anticipate um, the availability of that or an update to your board sometime later this week. Uh, we are also hand in hand while we pursue an increase in the availability of testing, we are also standing up um, our tracing, isolation, quarantining unit so that we can track and support those who are positive. The ability to prevent infection in people who are at risk with more severe COVID-19, we are working on that, identifying the vulnerable groups. And again, this ties to testing, this ties to um, making sure that we have a quarantining and supportive services in place. The ability of the hospital and health system to handle surges, this is an ongoing conversation with our healthcare partners. The ability to develop therapeutics to meet demand, this is something that we are looking to Sacramento to support. The ability for businesses, schools, childcare facilities to support physical distancing, Again, this is in the works, in planning stages, in partnering with all of these stakeholders. The ability to determine when to reinstitute certain measures as the stay at home orders if necessary. And again, we are looking at what is happening in Sacramento, receiving guidance from CDPH, as well as um, having discussions with our neighboring counties on lessons learned with um, their attempts as well. So with that, I hand it over to Nancy. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. The governor's release of the six critical indicators has led many of our businesses and community members to ask, what does this mean for them? It has prompted, it has prompted our um, county, like many other counties, uh, to consider economic reopening and how we can do this safely and efficiently. The governor said there is no precise timeline for modifying the stay-at-home order, but that the six indicators would serve as a framework for making that decision. Over the next four to six weeks, we'll be developing a strategic, phased reopening plan that complies with national and state guidance. It will outline the steps that can be taken safely um, as we deal with the, ep epidemic, the epidemic transmission brought under control, and we will include tools and approaches uh, to target infection containment under less restrictive orders. A project team will be organized that includes several county staff, a representative from the schools, and a panel of medical professionals to help drive the process. We are fortunate to have REACH, a coalition of business and civic leaders that have supported Slow County and its emergency operations and recovery planning to be available and interested in assisting Santa Barbara to succeed in this same process. We hope to engage REACH to help develop the plan and facilitate stakeholder collaboration efforts. It is expected that REACH's work with the Slow County's plan and their expertise in engaging a wide variety of business and community groups will expedite our project timelines. 
We will be identifying key stakeholder participants for our countywide stakeholder team to guide our respective uh, industries such as government, schools, and business. A draft plan document will be provided to this team for input and guidance related to their respective industries. And finally, the document will be submitted to our public health director for approval and submitted to your board. This is a significant project that will involve many throughout the community and we look forward to getting started on it. With that, the public health director and I are happy to any answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Any questions from board members? Supervisor Williams. Uh, do we have or, or could we obtain an estimate of the number of healthcare workers we have in the county versus how many have been tested and how that compares to the general population? We have, uh, we have the number of healthcare workers who are positive. Um, that is information that we, we have disclosed before. Um, with regards to the number of testing, that's the, the that's number the, overall tested versus tested. the number of overall healthcare workers there are in the county. So um, the that's a slippery, a more slippery slope or complex answer. So on our website, we do post the number of tested and of that who's negative and who's positive and who's pending. We don't believe that that is a true depiction of all the cases or all the tests that's being conducted in our county. So over the past week, we have been working with various hospitals, various um, commercial labs to really arrive at what is that true number. And with that, I think we'll be able to give you a better answer. And um, we have somewhat, I, right now, I can say that what's posted on our website, we have about a 50% increase above that number in terms of the total number of tests. But yes, we have the number of positive um, healthcare workers. We have not pulled out the number who are negative. And I'll, I'll just, uh, first of all, say I think it's encouraging that um, we are uh, engaging with REACH and assessing a, uh, a reopening plan. I mean, I think that um, we should be trying to trim off some time on that reopening plan, not so much to um, be, sh because we would reopen within that time frame, but because we should be ready as soon as possible um, to understand how we're going to do it. Um, I would also, advocate that we consider, um, uh, you know, at least one sector for reopening before this and separate from this plan, and that is um, the healthcare sector. Uh, and I'll walk you through my logic. Um, we have a higher proportion of people tested in that. Uh, I think we should probably assess how much that is uh, uh, in that sector. Um, so that corresponds to the governor's principles. The other principles, if there's any sector that we could rely on to be able to implement those principles, it would be the healthcare sector. Um, and because the, the stay at home order has actually caused layoffs in the healthcare industry, which is to me a very dysfunctional aspect um, to, to try to meet a public health crisis while we're laying off public health workers, while we're laying off healthcare workers, uh, lab techs, other folks, uh, seems a little crazy. And it's not obviously a purposeful uh, outgrowth of this policy, but it is an outgrowth of the policy. Um, also, it's a huge part of the economy. Uh, uh, and uh, healthcare techs and healthcare workers, the average healthcare worker, are not high-wage earners. They're people living at margins. Um, and so putting a whole lot of those folks into poverty would not have positive health effects either. And then I would just want to talk about the surge of people who are losing their insurance because of their layoffs. Um, 
So we don't just have a backup of elective procedures since the beginning of the crisis. You have to think we have a backup because there are going to be a lot of people who need to have a procedure before they lose insurance. Um, otherwise, frankly, they're going to be on the state's dime. Uh, and that just doesn't make sense um, for us to prevent them from getting a health care procedure um, before they lose their insurance coverage. So I'm just laying out a, a, a logic of why we should in particular look at and talk about um, uh, 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 limiting um, uh, a, a limited uh, opening for the healthcare industry um, uh, as a as a start. Perhaps Mr. Gazzoni could speak to the relationship of the governor's orders to our uh, flexibility here locally. Too that would probably help this. Thank you. Chair Hart uh, and Supervisors, we are uh, in a situation right now where we have a um, statewide emergency declared by the governor, a state public health emergency declared by the director of uh, California Department of Public Health, a local emergency declared by the board, and a local health emergency declared by the local health officer. So within that framework, the California Emergency Services Act is our starting point and by statute, that makes clear that any order um, under the Emergency Services Act by the governor has the full uh, force and effect of law. So the starting point is that the governor's uh, statewide order has the effect of law. Um, as a general law county, um, it's a little more straightforward for us that the board's authority is to pass um, ordinances and regulations not in conflict with the general law. Public health is an unusual area where even charter counties and charter cities uh, do not have the flexibility that they would have in other areas. They also must comply with the order uh, from the governor. So in this case, um, the board has powers, the local public health officer has powers, but they're both uh, subordinate to the powers coming from the state in this declared emergency. I think that's the, that's the micro level. The macro in looking um, at the authority the governor has to act, probably if we go back to um, 1905, the US Supreme Court upheld the legislative mass vaccination and forced quarantine of Americans, even who were not showing any signs of smallpox. So that's the case that keeps coming up when we look at areas of public health. And our own Court of Appeal in looking at this in looking at this, um, tests public health ordinances, for example, the governor's order, to see if they are reasonably related to the public health goal. And the standard is that if challenged, uh, the validity, validity will be upheld unless it is clearly and unmistakably unconstitutional. So the starting point is the governor has much latitude in the area of public health, and the county responds within that framework if I, may I make a comment? I, um, yeah, though, before we go too far on this, I mean, I think the answer just misinterprets what I'm asking for. I, I'm not advocating for defying the state order. <laughs> I am yeah. advocating that uh, we ready ourselves for when the state order is modified right. or lifted. That is far, two very different things. That, that's not reopening things tomorrow. That's reopening things when they are appropriate, when we are in the downward uh, part of the curve. Um, and and I, I also think that our timing of reopening has a little bit, uh, it should, you know, we should be advocating during that time uh, with the state um, in various serious terms that our ability to sustain the stay at home order is uh, somewhat, somewhat dependent on, on, on state aid, um, not just for us, but for our constituents. Um, the state has received federal aid. Um, we have not received any of that aid. <laughs> um, and so we need to, I, I, I provided the CEO last week with a, 
a letter that um, Mr. Adam and I uh, wrote, and I hope that um, we will uh, synthesize somewhat uh, this, this board's view and really let the, let the governor know that our ability to sustain this very much is dependent on state aid, um, uh, not only to us, but to the many people who are slipping into poverty. And if anybody doubts that poverty has severe um, health care effects, um, there's just an article a couple days ago uh, out of New York Times um, that highlights a WHO study on exactly um, that, um, that we will be having deepening poverty effects in the state and that will have deepening health effects. Um, so we, we have to um, take steps either through state aid or through thinking through uh, the restart of the economy on how to avoid um, lingering and severe uh, health effects on primarily children who are the ones who are impacted by um, the increased mortality associated with poverty. I believe CEO Miyasato has a slide specifically to address, and I think it's the next slide in the presentation, to talk about a draft letter that has been prepared in advance of the meeting. So, CEO Miyasato. So, supervisors, um, a few supervisors submitted letters for the board's consideration, and I, um, what's presented to you that was um, submitted and posted is a letter that combines comments um, from those two letters. It discusses the um, economic impacts to the county. It talks about the impact to our most vulnerable. And um, we're asking that, yes, we want to open up our economy as soon as possible. We are staying within the framework of the governor's six points. But as Supervisor Williams said, we will need more funding for the things that uh, Dr. Dovernoso talked about for us to be ready and aggressive in um, opening back our economy. So that's the gist of the letter, and it's provided to you for your direction or amendment this morning. And I think the timing is really um, excellent because the governor is proposing to speak to the state tomorrow um, about this subject. So if we can get that letter um, to him today, that would be excellent. And I know that you have already drafted a letter that would, I think, integrate our comments. And if we have additional ones, we can, we can add that as, as the day goes along. So Supervisor Hartman has a question or comment. Thank you. Um, I just very much support the REACH, uh, contracting with REACH. Uh, I knew them as Hourglass and uh, working on economic development in North County and South Slow County. And I think they bring a lot of focus and talent to the effort. Uh, and I'm eager to have them working with different sectors. Can you describe, do we, have we identified the sectors and about how big the work group would be? Um, we're, we're thinking about that. That'll probably be solidified by the end of this week and early next week. Um, we're looking to encompass um, uh, many sectors that are interested in participating, um, broadly uh, agricultural, uh, any of our businesses related to tourism, um, uh, and we'll identify uh, individuals who will represent those groups and be able to communicate th with them quickly and efficiently to get comments and that type of thing back. And I have a couple of questions, I think, for Dr. Dorino. So, uh, it, as I look at the governor's roadmap number four, the ability to develop therapeutics to meet demand, what does that mean? That means uh, development of vaccine, development of additional treatment, uh, pharmaceutical treatments available to our identified cases. Yeah, so, I, I mean, we certainly don't expect that anytime soon. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, the, the roadmap, the framework is very broad. I know there are uh, answers to questions and that gives us more guidance, but uh, I'm not sure how much flexibility we have within this uh, and, and whether we have flexibility within the county or we intend to do the whole county uh, as, as one unit beginning to open up different sectors with certain uh, guidelines as to how to social distance or how to uh, uh, vary hours in schools and the different things we can do and how effective they would be. 
uh, in comparison to other strategies. Right. Um, you know, that was, I was on a uh, phone call with CDPH, uh, hosted a call last night with all of the jurisdictions, the public health directors and public health officers. And, and this came up, the uh, governor's roadmap. And my takeaway from that long conversation is that some counties are in better position um, than others to achieve multiple of these uh, 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 pillars. Um, my understanding from CDPH is that the governor has six work groups tackling all of these um, uh, items and the nuances, the strategies, and that they are looking to local jurisdictions for any of the expertise they have in any of these areas. So several of the jurisdictions who have thought through the six um, pillars or initiatives and offered to help, and they are taking those um, into consideration. But in particularly, number four, I think that has uh, for a county our size, as well as many other counties, that is something that's going to be driven by CDPH and, and the governor. So just a couple more specific questions. Uh, do you have any numbers for the Air Force Base? I don't. Um, it is grouped in that area. Okay. And that is, do, is there something specific? No, that you no, I just uh, was curious uh, if, if if we had any right. knowledge specifically of that, of the Air Force Base, but, but it's grouped in the Burton Mesa, Lompoc together. area communities. If I may share, um, there has, I have received emails of um, concerned community members wondering if any of those numbers can be tied to um, cases um, at the prison. And I can say that of the cases that's occurring in that area is not tied to the prison. Okay, and, and I guess this is for Mr. Gazzoni. Uh, so the governor's, uh, does the governor and, and the health orders that we have define the essential businesses and if you're not essential, you cannot operate and, and so we can't start opening them up earlier, is that correct? Chair and supervisors, we have uh, called several times a day on looking at the latitude the county has uh, in this area, and I would say that the order by the governor and the order by the state public health officer are both very short, half page by the governor and basically a page by the public health officer, and then link through hyperlinks to other documents, including federal standards, and unfortunately, some frequently asked questions, and that's what we're managing to. So when we look at that, we are looking in each category for what latitude that the county, either through the board or through the local health officer, would have. But I can't give you a crisp answer on that because the short orders by hyperlink go to other documents and they're not crisp. Uh, and one of the reasons why we have local health orders for several of the counties that we work with is so that the uh, population would actually know what is and is not prohibited because managing directly off these state orders is very difficult. And then an another question, if I may continue. Uh, I, I hope that the work we have with REACH doesn't uh, duplicate what's happening in the work groups at the state level. Is there any way to coordinate? Supervisors, um, through the chair, we, our intention is that they won't, but we know that the governor has said that certain things will be left at the local level, and I think that um, our local community would be best ones to talk about how would you implement social distancing in our schools and our businesses. So I think that will be the big focus. And then uh, I guess this will be my final. Uh, we are, uh, the, the Latino community is um, overrepresented in the cases and um, that is very concerning. And I, I wonder if you could speculate why and uh, what more we can do. Um, I think that the efforts that we have underway, which is the Immigrant Health Rapid Response Task Force, 
which is a is is comprised of the public health department, UCSB, and uh, service agencies, advocacy groups. I think that is something that we are all working on, identifying and asking the reason why that is. And so, in the in the weeks to come, we'll be able to really think through and and come up with strategies on addressing that. Meanwhile, I think that what the county has done is, is, is um, commendable in terms of we have a website that is solely in Spanish. We tweet, we, we um, communicate in real time specifically in Spanish. Not only that, but we also engage our partners in interpretation. And so I think those are, um, will be very helpful strategies. And again, that is something that we will look to the community to help us um, tune in and focus our efforts. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from colleagues in Santa Maria? Yes, I have a question and a comment. This is for Dr. Del Reynoso. So if you test me today and I am negative, could I be exposed later the same day and then be positive after the test and shedding virus and spreading virus even though you just cleared me for work or school or whatever else? So uh, Supervisor Adam through the chair, if you are tested today and you are asymptomatic, are you asymptomatic or symptomatic? I am asymptomatic. If you are asymptomatic and we test you, that is a point in time test that just describes how the state of the virus present or not present in you. So when the test come back, comes back in a day and it is negative, that does not mean that you can't be exposed meanwhile or the days ahead to the virus and become positive. Does that answer your question? Okay, so, yeah, 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 it does. Uh, so, so what we're talking about in the governor's order is, is testing for positive, right? This is not for anybody. I think that uh, in the earlier, it's both. I think that in the earlier guidance that I had read, it was still prioritizing symptom symptomatics. But I also know that there is relative, relatively uh, quickly around the corner the availability of serology testing to gauge the uh, whether that individual has had exposure to the coronavirus family. So that serology testing is around the corner um, with regards to becoming available in our community. Well, and that will what we're talking about here what we're talking about here is contact tracing, isolating, and supporting those who are positive or exposed. And that, that would only be um, relative to the positivity Correct. testing. Am I right? Correct. Yeah. So, so my point here is, and I think you've made my point, is that it really has no value if you can get a negative test and walk out the door, be exposed, and then begin shedding and spreading virus, uh, even though you just got cleared for, I don't, you know, you see this, it just negates the, the usefulness of the, the strategy for, uh, in, for purposes of, of reopening our, our society. And now on to my comment. Uh, you know, we, we are in the process of self-inducing a depression. Um, we're, we're, you know, we're talking about uh, taking uh, or having negative effects on children. I, I can't imagine a more negative effect and lasting effect than uh, just, just having a, a, a permanent reduction of the standard of living for our children. Um, there was a Chamber of Commerce statement the other day that one in 10 
Uh, businesses couldn't last a month, and one in four couldn't last two months like this. And we're, we're into a month right now. We're over a month right now. And, and I would recommend, and I know we won't get any traction on this board for this, but I, I would just for public purposes, I would recommend at least interpreting the governor's order as liberally as possible and open our economy as soon as possible fully, if not simply defy it and uh, make him come and enforce it. Because I think it's void for vagueness, among other things. And I think that uh, we, we have a responsibility to future generations to reopen this thing. And yes, some people are going to get sick, and that's, uh, that's unfortunate. But uh, you know, some people are going to get sick in any case. And we can't stop that. And, and we're, we're just inducing a depression. And I find that just, just appalling. Supervisor Adam, if I may clarify, the intent of the um, governor's roadmap number one is really to test those who are asymptomatic that may be positive. So we want to make sure that we capture those positives and contain them. You alluded to spreading. So that is the point of the number one, to be able to broadly um, tests in our community so that we can identify the positives and um, stop the spread to vulnerable populations as well as to protect our health care system. Okay, so do you ever get a uh, false positive? The PCR from that question came up um, during our call with uh, CDPH. And uh, the official statement that the PCR done in a complex laboratory uh, um, setting is 95 to 99% <coughs> uh, on point. <coughs> However, there are other so tests that yes, are not. we get false positives. I'm sorry? So that's a yes, we get false positives. Yes. Okay, so, so we're talking about uh, contact tracing and isolating and supporting the people that are false positives? Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, I think that our team is fairly sophisticated and so would, through their contact tracing, would be able to sift through those false positives. CEO Sato, did you want well, to add something? Uh, um, Supervisor, through the chair. So there are a lot of questions, and I think um, Supervisor Adams just pointing out the complexity and sometimes the contradiction that could occur with all of this that is occurring now in this in the pandemic. And part of what we're trying to do with we're using reach as well and experts is to clarify our understanding of how that actually would proceed. Um, so there are a lot of questions. You're right, to, to, if you follow it through its rational conclusion, that would mean everyone would have to be tested consistently. Um, so there, there's gonna have to be a practical application and that's what we'll be looking for and that's what we're hoping this reopening process will help us do, working with our public health officials in the department and also with um, experts that um, Ms. Anderson talked about. Thank you. I, I just wanna remind you that we didn't suspend the entire Bill of Rights so I think this is still America, and I think that uh, locking people up, especially if there's a possibility that there's false positives. I mean, you look at the justice system, and we err on the side of letting people go all the time. So uh, it's, it's, it's just unthinkable to me that, that we would go to this extreme, with, with, especially with what appears to be developing as a, uh, as a death rate in this thing. It's not any worse than the, than the regular flu. Thank you, Supervisor Adam. Supervisor Lavanina, did you have any questions or comments? I did, and, and uh, uh, let's see. I just wanna make sure that we're not saying that, and, and I really appreciate the fact that our CEO has negotiated with um, REACH, and that uh, I think that's something we're all gonna need is a roadmap of how to move forward once we go to a full reopen, but what I want to make sure is we're not saying that we aren't going to open until the REACH study is complete, correct? 
Supervisor Lavenue through the chair. I think we're not going to be reopening until there's clear guidance from the governor um, about that. We were having the reach plan ready, okay. but if, if the right. governor said tomorrow you could open up because we believe all right. the cases have dismantled, we would certainly do that and okay. work through it. As we again, we want to get the economy going um, as soon as it is safe. So right. we're okay. That's what I thought. Okay. So and then just a question for Dr. Renoso is so. I'm looking at the governor's orders, and, and some of them were, I think we've already, we can check the box that we've done this and we've done that, and of course it gets down to number one, which is the most difficult. But at what point, what can we look at as citizens and looking at numbers and saying, you know, like I'm looking at the history and the charts and it shows that hospitalizations are basically flat, ICU is basically flat. Um, so we've done what we thought we were gonna do. So at what point, can an individual look at our charts and say, this is what the public health officer is looking for to where she will allow more um, leeway under the governor's stay at home order where we might open some more um, different industries. So we- Is there anything in particular? Yes. yes. So when we see not only the cases, but as you mentioned, hospitalizations going down consistently over a 14 day period, uh, that is the benchmark, if you will, other jurisdictions have used in order to consider uh, elective procedures, in order to um, clarify some of the recreational activities that can take place. So that would be our benchmark as well. When we see a consistent decrease in the number of cases and hospitalization in particularly over a period of say 14 days. Okay, and then my last question is, and I know, you know we've talked about this in other forms, but just for the public's benefit, there's to the south of us and north of us, there's been some changes in some of their um, directives about what essential businesses there are. And if you could just speak to that, I'm just thinking of one in particular, I've got a dog at home that is looks like a koala bear at this point. She's, <laughs> she's a mess. And uh, I know San Luis Obispo County is opening up pet grooming. And the problem is, is, you know, the reality is if something doesn't open in Santa Barbara County, people are going to do the wrong thing, which is then travel to San Luis Obispo County or Ventura County to get some of these essential services done. So I just think there kind of needs to be some, uh, you know, uh, consistency among the region. Um, you know, not just pet grooming, but grooming in general, uh, salons, those types of things. So when those open up, uh, are just kind of give us a feel of what you're looking at uh, as a region. Um, I think that as a region, we definitely want to be consistent in our policies of uh, what is allowable and what's not allowable. What's difficult is that our rates are different from Ventura and it is different from SLO. And within that context, we are looking at, um, we've received numerous requests um, about golfing, about tennis, about uh, pool usage. Um, didn't receive any about koala bear or pet grooming, um, but have received comments about um, barber shops and nail salons and um, massage therapy. Um, those are, and, and of course, uh, from the faith community. Um, so those are the variety of requests that we have received. And we are, this is something that's hot and high priority on our list. And we are in conversations with both of our neighbors to see what was the rationale behind them allowing particular um, businesses to operate and uh, seeking guidance and, and, and looking at our own numbers and seeing how that can inform our decision. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, um, a couple of thoughts that I had, and I know we do have public comment too, is that um, looking at the demographic numbers, um, I'm struck by the fact that they do kind of demonstrate the existence of structural equity issues. You know, historically, our communities of color and our immigrant communities haven't had equitable access to preventive care, um, culturally responsive health information, 
or even jobs that allow people to social distance um, and access paid leave. And so I'm, I'm impressed that our county is trying hard to address those issues through our communications to disadvantaged communities and um, particular outreach to those folks to make sure that, that they have the information that they need to be safe. And it is encouraging looking at the information um, that some of those messages are getting through, but it does point that we need to, to refocus on those and, and double down even more in that effort. Um, and then something that I know a number of uh, my colleagues have mentioned is, you know, we want the REACH process to be collaborative and include the input of stakeholders. At the same time, we would want it to be fast and responsive and ready to be, to be employed when the governor um, gives us that authority. And those things are honestly intention, and we have to understand that the more collaborative and the more um, inclusive we are in working with stakeholders, that necessarily takes more time. So we will have to figure that out and be balanced in that approach. And hopefully, you know, our partners and the people that we're gonna be asking to join us in this effort, um, I know that they understand the urgency of this and will be responsive and, and as fast as they possibly can. I think that is the part, though, that is generally the longest um, duration aspect of something like this, putting together the plan, you know, having on a technical basis will go faster than getting buy-in from all the stakeholders. And that's, that, that'll be a challenge for all of us in our community. Um, I think we have some public comment, Madam Clerk. Yes, Chair Hart and members of the board, we have four requests to speak on this item. I have one letter to be read into the record and then we're going to go to the phone for Andy Caldwell to be followed by Dr. Harris Gelberg and our final speaker is Corey Heyman. I will begin with a letter from Joe Armaderas. Chairman Hart and distinguished members of the board, reopen Santa Barbara County's economy. Sincerely, Joe Armaderas, Executive Director of the Santa Barbara County Taxpayers Association. And I will now go uh, to the phone for Andy Caldwell to be followed by Dr. Harris Gelberg.
Thank you, Mr. Caldwell. Just a couple of points that need to be clarified. Number one, um, the program that San Luis Obispo County has developed to create their reopening plan is the model that we are using. We're, we're using, in fact, the same entity to develop our plan. And um, so that point is not true. And, and I think it is important to recognize that there was a, a cross-partisan uh, letter from San Luis Obispo County that went to Governor Newsom yesterday asking that they be given authority to reopen their, um, their county because their situation, they believe, is, is unique. And the governor spoke to that letter directly in his comments yesterday, saying that that was premature and that people need to realize that people travel around the state of California and that while things may be in one condition in one place, people um, in other parts of the state are in very different circumstances and have the ability to travel, and that that is something that the state is concerned about and looking at um, from a, that larger perspective. Um, do we have another? Public commenter. Chair Hart, members of the board, yes, we have an additional um, three speakers. We are going to Dr. Harris Goldberg to be followed by Corey Heyman, and we had an additional request by Terry Strickland. If while we're warming up, I could say that uh, up here in Santa Maria, at least, we did not hear Mr. Caldwell very well. So if there's some switch that can be flipped or something to get a better uh, sound out of that phone, um, that would be good. And, and I'm kind of amazed at this point we don't have uh, some way to directly connect that into the, to the audio system. Thank you, Supervisor Adam. We'll get it closer to the mic. Thank you for that comment and just so you know we have offered um, and have brought tests to the prison for their staff to be tested um, with the county's test kits next public commenter yes our next speaker is Corey Heyman to be followed by Terry Strickland Chair Hart, members of the Board of Supervisors, I first want to thank you for your leadership throughout this COVID-19 crisis in our county. Um, I want to speak specifically to the um, REACH engagement, and I would like to further echo Supervisor Labanino's comments that we cannot wait for a stakeholder advisory group and delay our transition into the next phase of the pandemic by four to six weeks. The delay is not supported by the data and hospitalizations are down. The fatalities are very low. Our neighboring counties have already recognized that it is time to transition to less disruptive public health and social distancing measures based on similar data. We need not trail them by several weeks. We do not have the luxury of waiting four to six weeks to begin gradually reopening our economy. As the UCSB economic forecast webinar made abundantly clear last week, 
Our county is in economic collapse, and we know that people are not getting the health care that they need for non-COVID-19 conditions. Every day that passes under the state home order now makes matters worse for our county and not better. We need the board to move much more quickly and reopen our economy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hammond. And our final speaker is Terry Strickland. Hart and the board. Uh, watching the presentation today, the most worrisome part for me was the graph showing the four to six weeks to develop a plan. Uh, first, because I've never known a government agency to be able to accurately propose timelines. So if that isn't a good timeline and it's more like eight to 12 weeks, this will put a lot of out of business signs all over this county. Uh, Slow County could get a group together and have concluded that they will have a plan shortly. If Santa, so I have a couple questions. You know, if Santa Barbara County is modeling them, why is it going to take us so long to do what Slow County has done more quickly? Of course, we want people to be safe. I know people who have had the virus. My husband has COPD. So we know the seriousness of the situation. We've taken all the precautions but not lifting some of these restrictions sooner rather than later will be devastating to our community. I'm not saying this is just about the economy and money. The stress of this lockdown cannot be shown on the chart. I would think San Bernardino County has enough smart people being paid with our tax dollars to figure out what is best for our community more than the governor of this state. Uh, the other question I have is what is the best guess date of reopening businesses? And thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Strickland. Um, Ms. Miyasato, did you want to have some comments about the timing? Yes, I mean, we will move with alacrity. Obviously, we want this all done. But again, this is going to be based on whether um, we are allowed to move forward with reopening of the economy based on the governor's order. So a couple of things. Um, so County, we're working with the same consultant, or we hope to be uh, finalizing that contract. But they have not produced a plan yet. I just want to be clear. They are still in the process of having it uh, working with their stakeholders. So they, too, haven't finished their plan yet. So just to be clear about that. And the last thing is there's going to be comparisons with Santa Barbara County and other communities. And I just want to restate that some of the other communities, um, other counties in the state, when the governor issued um, his stay-at-home order, other counties uh, before that did their own orders which were somewhat, in some cases, more restrictive than the governor's order. We didn't do that. We relied on the governor's order. We did a, a, an amendment, or we did our own order after that, clarifying some things. But some of the things that we've seen in other counties where it looks like they're easing restrictions, they could be easing restrictions because their original order was more restrictive than the governor's order. So I want to clarify that. Um, for example, we never said health care facilities should be closed down. That was always an essential function, like an essential um, operation. And I think if that's happening, it's not because of our action or the governor's action. That's because of the health care agencies are, are trying to figure out how to protect themselves as well. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, Supervisor Williams. <clears throat> well, I, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, both of you as my colleagues to highlight the um, uh, iniquities uh, revealed by the disaggregated data. Uh, this has been uh, a thing that I've long advocated for um, uh, during my uh, tenure as chair of the Asian Pacific Islander Caucus of the state legislature, that you, if you don't disaggregate data, you don't reveal uh, inequities that exist. Uh, and the revealing of those inequities is the first step towards addressing those inequities often. So I, I want to thank the Public Health Department for, for uh, um, gathering that. It's not easy, as I've found out. I made the, the request thinking, okay, you guys could look at some spreadsheets, you could ask, ask some, some hospitals, but no, you, you had to go in and do post facto interviews because some of that data is not 
uh, given uh, to the hospitals, and the hospitals can't always disclose all of that to you. So I, I want to thank you for that level of um, effort on, on behalf of populations that are evidently disproportionately affected. Um, and just to, to address, uh, you know, uh, the, the charge um, by Mr. Caldwell that this letter is in, in inadequate, I, I would just want to say in defense of, of, of Mona that um, she largely took the letter that, that Mr. Adam and I wrote. Um, uh, she, um, instead of inviscerating it, she surgically altered it. Um, uh, <laughs> Get, taking out just a couple of the edgier things that I probably would have uh, put put in, but rem, but keeping really a very important message and a very important balance of our public health needs with our economic. And I'm just going to just read a short portion. In closing, we appreciate the thought you have put in developing the essential indicators for modifying the stay-at-home order that will allow residents to return to work as soon as possible while continuing to protect the collective public health of our state and our healthcare system. Our county's ability to successfully work in alignment with your framework and to alleviate the severe economic and social consequences that will worsen as each month goes by are dependent on new resources from the state and federal government. I think that's a real balanced and important message and one that the board can unify on. Um, we want public health to be protected we also don't want people to lose jobs and to perpetuate uh, and perpetuate deepening poverty. Thank you. I agree. Um, Supervisor Hartman. Uh, thank you. Uh, two points I'd like to make. The first is that uh, it seems to me, as far as reach and the economic reopening, that we'll we'll soon need to make a distinction between businesses that are essential and businesses that are safe to reopen. I think we've learned a lot in these practices about uh, how to operate safely, even at grocery stores with the six feet and the masks and wiping things off. Uh, I just for Supervisor Lavanino, my dog is going to the vet today. It's going in a crate. We call, come get the dog, bring it in for the treatment, take it out, we can pick it up again. Uh, so I think that would work for grooming. I think there are a lot of things we've learned in grocery stores that would work for other retail stores. Uh, I know feed stores in the San Inez Valley are open. I don't know why those same practices couldn't be applied with plexiglass and six feet. Um, so it just, uh, uh, so I think it's, as soon as we can, if you can operate safely, uh, I think that would be very important. I'd also like to propose that uh, I know a lot of cities are waiving TOT for, uh, for um, hotels, motels, and uh, short-term rentals, uh, homestays. Wonder if we might consider doing that, uh, waiving fees and delaying till the end of June. We typically collect that monthly. I don't think it would really hurt us in terms of our county system, and so that might provide some relief. A number of cities have done it, so I'd like to propose that if uh, other board members might support it. Any other comments from other board members? Well, first of all, I didn't think that was on the agenda today. Is that a proper thing to comment on? Mr. Guzzoni. Mr. Ms. Miyasato. Supervisors, we, um, on the agenda we have provide direction, so you could provide direction and we could either come back or take action as, a, as the emergency services director. And Chair and Supervisors, uh, CEO did check with me and I assured her that we were within the Brown Act noticing requirements with this letter. Thank you. Okay, so um, yeah, I'll comment on the TOT. I'm not in favor of that because we uh, uh, collect that or, or hotels collect that on our behalf from patrons who think they're paying taxes and know they're paying taxes and if, if uh, we don't uh, collect those taxes up front and we effectively make a low interest or a no interest loan to businesses at taxpayer expense I don't I don't think that that's uh, I don't think that's kosher and then my other comment was uh, uh, this lives versus money uh, debate that keeps coming up in this 
uh, in this issue here is it's just a false dichotomy. You know, um, there's going to be some lives lost in either case. And as, as Supervisor Williams said, poverty kills too. Uh, uh, a couple of uh, uh, things that are going to go up are, are domestic violence and uh, uh, suicides. And, and that has nothing to do, those are lives that have nothing to do necessarily with COVID. So, um, and, and, and there's other assorted mayhems that will ensue because we've shut off this economy. So I, I think that uh, I, I would love to stop hearing about this lives versus money stuff because that's, that's really not uh, a, a reality. Thank you. Are there any other comments from the board? All right. Well, thank you all for making this um, presentation possible and covering a lot of territory. We do need a motion, I think, in regards to the letter. Um, is there a motion to Supervisor Williams? I'll move uh, approval uh, of uh, the the Miyasato draft of the letter and uh, uh, transmission to the governor and state legislators. Is there a second? Second. Supervisor Adams, Supervisor Levinino. Um, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Yes, thank you. Chair Hart, members of the board, just to clarify, that does include recommendations A through C on staff's agenda today. That is correct. Thank you. Ms. Hartman? Aye. Mr. Adam? Reluctantly, aye. Mr. Lavanino? Aye. Mr. Williams? Aye. Chair Hart? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you all for your comments and additions to the conversation. Mr. Gazzoni, did you have something? Okay. All right. Let's take a 10-minute uh, break and then come back at 11.15. Uh,